Thank you very much for inviting me here to this very important summit. And thank you very much for Doris Schopper and especially the team of the French Red Cross that has made it possible that I can speak to you even from a large distance. My talk is about this very important and intriguing um, notion how conflict and climate change is connected to each other. Now, the term conflict is of course very broad. It can really range from a marital dispute with incidents of domestic violence to the very high intensity violent conflicts that are happening in war zones. There is now robust evidence that climate change affects human security. And there's evidence that climate change affects all types of conflict in different ways. An example of small-scale conflict concerns the impact of the warming of the sea near Greenland. This, this warming has affected the roots of seals and whales and other animals, and hence hunters find it more difficult to find animals to hunt and are staying more at home. This in turn has led to an increase in alcohol consumption and domestic violence. This is of course not a direct effect, as all this is happening in a context of a colonial past, economic dependency on hunting, changing aspirations and lifestyles. Yet, climate change played a definite role. In a similar way, correlations have been found between climate change and road rage, assault, murder and rape, and between climate change and intergroup conflicts, including riots, ethnic violence, land invasions, gang violence, civil war and other forms of political instability such as coups. However, considering this wide range of conflict, my research and also this talk, I focus mostly on violent conflicts. My research program concerns the nexus between disaster and conflict. We are looking into different conflict scenarios. We have case studies of high intensity conflicts that are done in South Sudan, Afghanistan and Yemen case studies of low-intensity conflicts in Ethiopia, Myanmar and Zimbabwe, and case studies of post-conflict yet fragile countries in Nepal, Sierra Leone and Haiti. My most important message is that climate change doesn't make war, people do. So where climate change is the living environment, it depends on the institutional and personal adaptation capacities whether this leads to further tension or even violent conflicts. Climate change is a threat multiplier, so it worsens existing social, economic and environmental risks and degradation that play a role in conflict. Although there may be no direct causality, climate change is also described as a vector or multiplier of vulnerability and contributes to poverty and inclusion that contribute to conflict. So in very many ways, it can be said that climate change may make the risks for conflict worse. But there is also vice versa. Conflict may also multiply the effects of climate change in undermining people's capacity to adapt. As I mentioned, of course, climate change itself doesn't have an effect. It really depends on the adaptation capacities, whether or not the effects of climate change turn into a human disaster. And because conflict may undermine institutional adaptation, capacities and collective action, for that reason climate change can also, uh, or conflict can also exacerbate those conditions that make and turn climate change into a disaster. Now, to show that, we can go back to that very old, very good pseudo-formula that explains that the disaster risk is the outcome of hazards, vulnerability, and is then mediated by capacities, in this case, adaptation capacities. So, what we see is that whole, uh, the whole of disaster risk, so with all those different components, this can all be affected by climate change, Yet these same components can also be affected by conflict and hence the conditions of conflict can affect the conditions of climate change or the effects of climate change and the other way around. So we are dealing with a whole complex of relationships where the exact causality may sometimes be obscured but we can definitely see that there are contributions of climate change to conflict and the other way around that conflict can exacerbate the effects of climate change and turning climate change in a human disaster. Example might be Yemen, where drought is increasing, where it used to be part of people's history, 
Yemen and drought comes together, so people know how to adapt, although it may get worse through time. And now, because of the conflict, the adaptation capacities of people are further undermined, so the drought that used to be reasonably well adaptable is now a major disaster and causing major famine. Conflict is complex, and especially at the local level. Conflict is usually layered, so the national conflict will matter, but local conflict is also manifested through different causes and dynamics. And that is very important to take into account when we are dealing with that nexus between conflict and climate change. It can work out completely different at the local level. And especially at the local level, we know that the relationship between climate change and conflict may be tighter. There may be more causal relationship. Because many of the local conflicts, they start around land management and forest resources. And that, of course, is especially something that gets affected by climate change. But we always have to remember, it's not a, although there's a contributing relation, it's not a direct causal relation, because there's so many other factors at play. And these could range from historical factors, power relations, factions, gender, exclusion. All these factors can contribute to those local conflicts, which are a manifestation of larger still scale conflict, but have a whole dynamics of their own. Now, important to remember as well is that climate change adaptation intervention can also be an additional source of conflict. At the local level, projects meant to adapt communities for climate change can actually exacerbate tensions. I have an example here for, from Afghanistan, where there was a very severe drought, 2017, 2018, just one, two years ago. And what you see is that the First, the coping capacities have been degraded by the conflict. Government is weakened, not able to protect. Importantly, the international community that might step in with relief measures is, you might say, distracted. They have, they have their focus on the high conflict zones within the country and don't have almost like the mental space to realize that the drought is really affecting people and they should also be in those parts of the country. People then, in those communities, resort to despair migration and that gives new social tension in the, in the community where they go, to the destination community where all these people arrive and that gives another level of tension and local conflict that then, of course, may translate to conflict at higher levels at the province or the nation. Mitigation measures can, as I mentioned, also have adverse effects. This is again from Afghanistan. So what we see is a, is a little wall to protect the community against flash floods. But inside the community, it creates a lot of, lot of tensions. First, who can work on the wall? Who is hired as laborer? Who is not? And those are not hired as labor. Are they from a particular group? Are they from another group? And how does that fit into the existing rivalries and power relations? What is the location of the wall? Who will be affected? Really, whose land is used for this wall? And then be between communities, we also see including ten uh, increasing tensions. This wall will affect the river flow, and that also modifies irrigation patterns. So that means that perhaps for upstream or downstream communities, the effects of this wall can be very different one community may benefit, whereas for the other community it's problematic. So that creates further tensions between the communities. That means that if you do mitigation measures, adaptation measures, you have to make sure that these are really conflict sensitive and that they fit into where the, the local dynamics are. Health needs may expand with climate change. And a very good example of this is dengue. Dengue is very rapidly increasing, very substantially increasing. It used to be only in nine countries, now we see it in more than 100 countries. There's a long-term trend upwards and also many sudden outbreaks. Prevention and case management have positive results. And globally, we actually see a 28% decline in case fatality, which is great. However, if we translate this to conflict areas, it's easy to imagine that the erosion of health structures and health infrastructure in those countries would make dengue a real disaster in those countries. 
health and interventions in conflict relations. What can we conclude? First, when we look at the high intensity conflict scenarios, we have to realize that health is also related to livelihoods. So anything we can do to maintain the livelihood capacities for people in conflict will also protect a further deterioration of their health situation. So maintaining livelihoods interventions in conflicts very important and develop where possible DRR interventions. In Afghanistan we actually see quite a lot of DRR programs and if these are being done in a conflict sensitive way they can make a difference and there is scope in other conflict areas as well to work on livelihoods and DRR. When it comes to the health responses, I think it's very positive that the humanitarian community is now more serious about localization and the localization is really to result in the strengthening of local aid health facilities. Also in conflict situations, because if their own institutions can't cope, it is really difficult for people to just have all these international interventions all the time. Low intensity conflicts. We have to be sure that we protect humanitarian space that often comes with more authoritarian regimes, protecting humanitarian space and especially protecting minorities that may be excluded from protection measures that are done by the government. And finally, in post-conflict areas, I would like to say that we have to really be beware of the coordination and the strengthening capacities of local institutions and be careful with all the international actors that we usually find in those situations that we don't create parallel systems to help people with their health problems in relation to climate change. Thank you very much.